declared a pandemic early last year, very few of us thought it would last this long. But now it seems like the new normal. As of yesterday, 131 million cases and 2.5 million deaths have been reported globally, out of which 3.1 million cases and 78,000 deaths are in the WHO African region. COVID-19 has hit all countries hard, but its impact has been harshest on those communities and individuals that were already vulnerable, more exposed to the infection of the virus, less likely to have access to good quality healthcare services, and more likely to experience the adverse consequences of lockdowns or other measures uh, that were put in place to contain the pandemic. The COVID-19 pandemic has really shone a light on inequalities between countries. Amid shortages of essential supplies, African countries have been pushed to the back of the queue in accessing COVID-19 test kits, always bringing up the question of, do we really have a good idea how bad the situation is in Africa, for example, of personal protective equipment and now of vaccines. Vaccines offer great hope to turn the tide of the pandemic. But to protect the world, we must ensure that all people at risk everywhere, not just in countries that can afford vaccines, are immunized. And of the 448 million COVID-19 vaccine doses administered worldwide already, only 11 million or 2% have been in Africa, whereas the continent accounts for around 17% of the global population. There are also inequities within countries, inequalities and sometimes discrimination based on gender, place of residence, income, educational level, age, ethnicity, and disability intersect to disadvantage vulnerable populations. Recent data from 17 African countries show, for example, that a person with secondary school education is three times more likely to have access to contraception than someone who has not attended school. Those in the highest economic quintile are five times more likely to deliver their babies in health facilities and have their babies vaccinated with BCG compared to the poorest groups. To improve the situation, we need to act collectively on the social and economic determinants of health by working across sectors to improve living and working conditions and access to education, particularly for the most vulnerable and marginalized population subgroups. Communities need to be engaged as partners through their networks and associations to help shape and drive health and development interventions. The Presidential Health Compact of 2019 is a commendable step by the South African government towards fostering a partnership-oriented approach to health reforms, as well as joint accountability for health system strengthening and universal health coverage in the country. A key challenge in overcoming inequities is that there is limited data showing who is being missed and why. To address this, national health information systems need to capture age, sex, and equity stratified data. This information can then be used to inform more targeted decision and policy making, as well as resource allocation and intervention. At WHO, we're working with countries to strengthen capacities to collect, manage, and use data, and to enhance monitoring and action to address avoidable inequities. In the past year, we have disseminated technical guidance on gender equity and COVID-19, for example, and trained 30 country teams, including in South Africa, in gender and health equity integrated programming. The teams are using the knowledge and skills gained to support equitable health response, including to deal with gender-based violence in the context of COVID-19. Investment is also needed to accelerate progress towards universal health coverage, to protect individuals and households from financial hardships in accessing needed care and to improve service coverage. Most African countries have initiated reforms in these areas, believing that these will in turn contribute to building more resilient health systems, societies, and economies. And in this regard, 
WHO applauds the efforts of South Africa in the establishment of the national health insurance as a key component of the health reform. Although the pandemic has slowed down the progress in legislation and rollout of the NHI, the COVID-19 response itself has also accentuated the need to improve access to essential health services to every single South African, irrespective of socioeconomic status, ethnicity, or place of residence. Moving forward, global leaders need to work together to address inequities in their own countries and abroad in the spirit of international solidarity. Specifically on COVID-19 vaccines, and here we are using the COVID-19 as an example of what must, must happen with regard to health more broadly. We strongly encourage pharmaceutical companies to expand their manufacturing capacities to overcome current supply shortages. We also encourage wealthy countries to share their doses so that the most at-risk populations in all countries can be protected to save lives and speed up the recovery from this global crisis. It's important and urgent for the narrative on global solidarity to translate into impactful action as soon as possible. It matters for sustainable benefit worldwide. As the co-chair of the Facilitation Council of the Access to COVID-19 Tools Accelerator, which has been developed by WHO and other partners and a number of countries at the global level, and also as the chair of the African Union in 2020. South Africa played a major role in improving access to essential, essential treatments, diagnostics, and vaccines. We advocate for continuation of these efforts in the SADC region and throughout the continent. And in this connection, I'd like to really thank and congratulate His Excellency President Ramaphosa, Honorable Minister Mkize, and all the officials and experts involved for their leadership and contribution to this unique and action-oriented effort. I'd like to commend Africa, South Africa also for the work that you are doing together with India, with the WTO, to drive for access in terms for equity in terms of intellectual property sharing. The pandemic has shown that governments must increase investment in public health, including funding for access to COVID-19 vaccines for all people and maintaining essential health services while responding to the pandemic. Most importantly, making national systems better prepared to prevent and respond to the next inevitable pandemic is absolutely critical. Health instead is central to economic and social well-being of countries and communities. This World Health Day, I'd like to call on member states, partners, civil society, communities, and other stakeholders to intensify work with WHO and our partners to achieve universal health coverage and to invest in addressing the social and economic determinants of health, to tackle inequities and build a fairer, healthier world. We must work collaboratively to scale up health system strengthening interventions and build resilient health systems that are able to prepare for and effectively respond to health crises while maintaining the core functions when a crisis hits and to quickly reorganize, adapt and transform based on the lessons learned during this current crisis. Also to invest in essential public health functions and build the core capacities as outlined in the international health regulations. This is indispensable for health security. Legislation and financing policies around emergency preparedness and response, surveillance systems, laboratory networks, the health workforce, community engagement, and effective communication with all community all constitute essential core capacities. Improved governance and collaboration for health and development to reduce health inequities. Use the whole of government and whole of society approach, which is the most pertinent for people-centered promotion of health and prevention, as well as emergency preparedness and response. Therefore, building community partnerships, mutual trust and solidarity, open communication and accountability. These are all a must for health security and UHC. But most important is always to consider the needs of the most vulnerable. 
WHO has commended the whole of society and whole of government approach adopted by South Africa in, response, in responding to COVID-19. So we see that COVID-19 is just the latest example of why WHO is so focused on achieving health for all, supporting the creation of the social, economic and environmental conditions that allow people to fulfill their health potential and overcoming barriers that prevent them accessing good quality health services and ensuring that those services are available everywhere and to everyone. As WHO, we remain committed to ensuring that all people in Africa and globally can realize this fundamental right to good health. And I'd like to end by wishing all a good World Health Day, a good continuation of the hard work in response to the pandemic. And I would just like to say that I will, before the end of the session, unfortunately, have to excuse myself to attend to another commitment. Thank you so much. And again, congratulations for all that South Africa is doing, though we recognize that the challenges remain huge. Thank you very much, uh, moderator. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Mwete. And we'd also like to uh, thank you for your leadership and your support um, as uh, the regional uh, chairperson of the WHO. Uh, we, we really, really appreciate your commendations, your kind words, and uh, the constant support that you're always providing for us. And now I wish to um, apologize profusely for missing the first item and in the process flouting protocol. Um, Deputy Minister, my sincere apologies, um, but if we may uh, please allow the Deputy Minister to uh, give his remarks now and uh, we will proceed for, from there. Deputy Minister, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Manzi, for this opportunity. Uh, let me also uh, pass my apology to our sister, the regional director for Afro, uh, Dr. Mweti, uh, because as the co-hosts, uh, we were indeed supposed to do the welcoming, but uh, it's never too late. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, kind words uh, uh, towards uh, South Africa. Um, um, Dr. Mkize, our Minister of Health, um, also Dr. Owen Kalua, the WHO country representative here in South Africa, uh, heads of UN agencies uh, who are participating, our panelists uh, uh, who are specialists who will be uh, speaking to us uh, later on, uh, the leadership of uh, civil society. I see quite a lot of uh, subscription to this webinar. Uh, I, I hope a majority also should be also from civil society. All our distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning. Uh, today, as uh, uh, our regional director for Afro has already indicated, being the World Health Day, we, were, we are commemorating on a global scale uh, this World Health Day, as uh, de uh, decided so by, designated so by the WHO, uh, at its formation in 1948. Uh, today we are commemorating under the theme Together for a Fairer, Healthier World. On this occasion, the World Health Organization calls for urgent action to eliminate health inequalities and mobilize action uh, to attain better health for all and leave no one behind. On this World Health Day 2021, uh, WHO is calling on leaders to monitor uh, health inequities and address their root causes to ensure that everyone has access to the living and working conditions that are conducive to good health and to quality health services where and when they need those services and to invest in primary health care to achieve health for all. Ladies and gentlemen, the period uh, of the pandemic of COVID-19 has brought back health into sharp focus. Good health isn't a privilege, but a basic right which must be provided for all. This is the basic essence of the World Health Day 2021, which is celebrated today with the purpose of campaigning uh, for the building of a fairer and healthier world. Inequalities have been with us from time immemorial, 
but can be reduced if not completely eliminated. Despite improvements in health outcomes globally, these gains have not been shared equally across different countries, different communities, and also across continents. The COVID-19 pandemic has had grave consequences for people already experiencing inequalities. The pandemic has disproportionately impacted those people already socially, economically, or geographically disadvantaged. And evidence shows a worsening trend of dis dis uh, disparities and inequalities across regions and also within countries as we experience here in South Africa. The theme of today's webinar is thus very appropriate in that in our efforts to protect the health, welfare and well-being of our people as a country, we must ensure that we take deliberate and directed efforts at creating and sustaining a fairer and healthier South Africa, especially for the most vulnerable sections of our population, such as the older people, uh, women, children, and the poor living, especially in our townships and also in rural areas, but also persons with disabilities and those suffering from various chronic uh, diseases. We look forward to a very fruitful deliberation du uh, during uh, this, uh, uh, especially during the panel discussions as well, and also during the Q&A when the members of, uh, uh, of the participants will be able to raise questions. I therefore take this opportunity on behalf of the Ministry of Health of South Africa and the department to welcome all of you to this important event and wish you very fruitful deliberations. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Program Director. Thank you very, very much, DM. And once again, apologies to the Deputy Minister, but uh, thank you. Nevertheless, uh, we are very appreciative of the message that you've just delivered for us. And now, without much further ado, I would like uh, to invite the Minister of Health, Dr. Zuelid Mkiza, to address us. The Minister, of course, is no stranger uh, to all of us. Uh, he is a very well-known political leader and our Minister of Health, uh, who has led us through one of the most uh, challenging uh, and testing times in our era. We know him, of course, as one of the longest-serving MECs of uh, health in KZN. Uh, and uh, then, of course, he progressed to be uh, an MEC of Economic Development and thereafter progressed to be um, the Premier of KZN. Uh, he was then uh, Treasurer General of the ANC and then was called upon to serve in uh, the Cabinet. And we now, of course, uh, after he has uh, done his service as uh, the Minister of Cocta, we now have him as our Minister of Health. This is just a very brief introduction uh, which has attempted to condense the really prolific uh, political career. So, Minister, I see that uh, you are ready for us. Thank you very much. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Program Director Dr. Manzi. <clears throat> My dear sister, the Regional Director for WHO Afro Region, Dr. Mweti, it's very nice to see you and uh, Really very pleased that you could join us today and that you could co-host with us a very important celebration. My Deputy Minister, my colleague, uh, Dr. Joe Patla, the MECs for Health who are present, heads of departments from the various provinces and other directors general present, Dr. Owen Kalua, WHO country representative for South Africa, uh, heads of UN agencies present, esteemed uh, panelists who are with us and the uh, representatives of uh, development partners present, chairpersons of boards and heads of uh, health uh, statutory bodies present with us, the leadership of civil society, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much. <clears throat> Thanks uh, to the uh, uh, regional director for the Afro region for the one wonderful address reminding us about where we come from with the WHO, but also in our struggle for better health for all our people. And thanks to the uh, Deputy Minister for his kind comments. It's a welcome honor for me to be making this address at this year's World Health 
Day on 2021, which is themed together for a fairer and healthier world. We're commemorating health in a time that has been exceptionally trying and demanding for almost every country in the world, irrespective of their social, political, and economic conditions. The past year and a half has uh, rapidly taught us that while we may result in, reside in different, uh, 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 different and very varied regions, we still are intertwined as humanity with respect to our health, health systems, and the types of interventions we must all implement to stop the spread of the virus, and in so doing, protect the rights to life for all our citizens, especially our most vulnerable population who have borne the brand of the pandemic. The emergence of the pandemic in the late 2019 and its rapid spread in 2020 created the necessary the necessity for the unprecedented actions and interventions by governments and non-governmental uh, players across the globe. So it has seen the citizens of the world experienced restriction of movement and the shutdown of many services to safeguard the lives. Many fellow citizens, especially in our regions, have experienced acute symptoms of an unprecedented health crisis, job insecurity, food insecurity, income insecurity, social disruption, political tensions, and psychological upheavals. The theme of today's webinar is thus very appropriate in that, is to, to, in that, in that uh, to protect the health, the welfare, and the well-being of our people, we must all ensure that we take deliberate and directed efforts to create and sustain a fairer and healthier South Africa, especially for the most vulnerable sections of our population, such as the elderly, children, the poor, the persons with disabilities and those suffering from chronic diseases. Now, our efforts to stop the spread of the pandemic we must make sure that we leave no one behind. For those that are vulnerable, <clears throat> we must secure an equitable, accessible, and sustainable social safety network to protect them from the pandemic. It goes without saying that to create and sustain health security for all our population, the solutions we implement to reverse the negative impact of the pandemic must be sustainable, broad-based, and must draw on the knowledge and capacities of all health sector stakeholders, both local and international. I am pleased to know today's, um, today's audience, it includes uh, states and non-state actors. And I've looked at the numbers, it looks like we've got over a thousand people. Were it not for the virtual platform would really be in a very big rally just now. This is a positive and reassuring sign that we all acknowledge the importance of collaboration as we combat the spread of the pandemic and progress towards the creation of sufficiently resilient health systems. According to the latest uh, available global data, South Africa remains one of the most unequal societies in the world. Our country is plagued by income inequality, and this is also reflected as health inequities. The most vulnerable of our people still struggle to access quality health services, whilst those in higher income groups benefit significantly from the health system, irrespective of whether they utilize public or pri private services. As highlighted in the Health Market Inquiry report, whilst the split of financial resources directed at health in the public and private sector is almost equal, there remains a vast disproportion in terms of the size and distribution of the population that each sector serves. The public sector <clears throat> serves 84%, while the private sector, primarily through medical schemes, serves the remaining 16%. This disparity is further worsened by the disproportionate distribution of key health professionals, such as general practitioners, specialists, dentists, and audiologists, the majority of whom are in the private practice and serves mainly individuals with uh, and households from high-income groups, despite the need for their services being greatest amongst the lower income and vulnerable groups. For example, in our case, a, more, a mere 24.8% of specialists work in the public sector, serving 84% of the population, while 75% uh, of the specialists are in the, uh, they work in the private sector, serving 16% of the population. Therefore, the universal health coverage agenda is critical for our context, as further highlighted by the current pandemic. Implementation of the national health insurance is a critical intervention that will assist in restructuring the core components of the health system. 
In turn, this will allow for better use and access to the capacity available in the health sector with better prioritization of the vulnerable. The reform agenda is based on enshrining the elements of universalism, equity, social solidarity, strategic purchasing, and access to quality health care services, <clears throat> and most importantly, financial risk protection. These principles will ensure that we attain the objective of universal health coverage through the phased implementation of our national health insurance, uh, national health insurance. Ladies and gentlemen, there are especially important lessons that we can draw from our experiences with the pandemic to date. And if we take these to heart and, approximately context and appropriately contextualize them, we can use them to leverage our health system reforms, uh, reform programs and build more resilient healthcare system capable of absorbing the next public health threat that may come our way. Whilst protecting the people from the devastating outcomes, we have seen during the COVID-19 pandemic. Please allow me to share some of the core country experiences as we address the pandemic and how these bode well for our health reform agenda. The lessons are drawn from our experience with the first and second waves, as well as the proactive interventions we're implementing to mitigate against subsequent waves. Firstly, one of the earliest interventions was to create a reliable mechanism for health systems governance to ensure that uh, uh, the effort was coordinated and, and efficient. This was supported by a robust surveillance system with high quality data input. With this evidence-based approach, our central structure of the National Coronavirus Command Council and the various ministerial advisory committees created to support government were able to foster confidence in the interventions proposed, especially those that require a great deal of social and financial sacrifice by sectors and, indi as, and, and individuals. Ultimately, you had a coordinated system that delivered the same message, which is backed by you know, scientific evidence for every decision that is taken. Secondly, I don't think there's a country that has not recognized the relevance of strengthening the health system's preparedness through assessing gaps and ensuring health service availability according to the need. Taking into consideration the WHO uh, 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 six building blocks, our health system's preparedness approach has strategically focused on mobilizing and fairly distributing the available human resources for health, assessing the existing hospital bed capacity, and creating innovative and sometimes expedited procurement processes to support a proactive response. In all these interventions, we've kept our door open for the ongoing involvement and consultation of our private healthcare uh, sector uh, uh, stakeholders. And here we've seen the movement, mobilization of resources to go and plug the gaps that were identified in the health services, be it in human resources, uh, supply uh, uh, of uh, uh, medicines and uh, uh, other uh, health uh, commodities, oxygen, equipment, and so on. Uh, all of this uh, has meant that the focus has been about prioritizing investment in health to improve the access of our people and also to provide a kind of network, uh, uh, the um, safety net rather, that would actually help our people to recover from the, from the pandemic. That in line with our shared concerns as for the realization of equitable access to quality health care, we ensure that the response remained government-led, <coughs> excuse me, with close collaboration across sectors. The role of the private sector was defined in the context of a unified system, and this is indeed a fundamental ethos enshrined in the NHI bill. That's our approach has been based on an all-inclusive strategy to draw on the full capacity of the health system. As examples, we combined all laboratory efforts and shared resources, combined all beds, and moved patients in equal volume between public and private facilities. And now for the first time in history, we have one digital system for capturing and certifying all vaccinated individuals. This we're going to be rolling out through, as we go through the vaccination program, but it must also be noted that the vaccination program is actually a combined uh, program uh, uh, involving public, private sector, and civil society formations in such a way that it's actually a seamless national program with everyone participating in it. A fourth lesson is in the field of data management integration and sharing and reporting. 
Early in the evolution of the pandemic locally, we made deliberate decisions to establish and in some instances leverage against existing systems to support the coordination and sharing information with the private sector on the one hand, and more importantly, with the public. This has proven essential for effective and timely monitoring, planning, and decision making. In this time of the fourth industrial revolution, we used opportunities to build technology such as the COVID Connect app for tracing the, of contacts and engaging in asymptomatic cases and the COVID Alert SA app, which is a free exposure notification application that lets people know when they have uh, been in close contact with someone who has tested positive for COVID-19. I continue to strongly recommend that all those in attendance Download and utilize these apps as they are quite innovative and helpful in supporting our response to the pandemic. As mentioned previously, the efficiency of our vaccination program has been greatly enhanced by the electronic uh, vaccine data system. I think most important for us has been the fact that whenever we issue the, uh, the statistics about people who are either in hospital who are protested positive, we never make a distinction whether, whether that happened in the public or private sector. We simply look at South Africans who have tested positive and it's a combination of the public, the public and private laboratories that will give us that uh, contribution. In fact, even at a time when there were problems of backlogs, we could shift the load from public to private and vice versa in order to make sure for an efficient system that serves all our people well. In terms of the uh, hospitalization, again, there's good collaboration right across with a, a very close uh, alignment of the treatment protocols right across. All, also, the, uh, <clears throat> the sharing of the beds between public and private, especially at ICU and general beds, we have actually had to do quite a lot of sharing between the public and private. And therefore, that has made us to actually align the two and make it clear that we're running one health system with both public and private uh, uh, arms of its cooperating. And I think that goes very well for the future of coordination and cooperation between the public and private sector. The fifth key lesson learned is the importance of diversifying procurement strategies. In our case, for example, our diversified approach included bilateral engagement with individual manufacturers, multilateral involvement through the COVAX facility, and engaging in regional approach to the African Union's vaccine acquisition task team. At all costs, our vaccine acquisition plan avoids the notion of vaccines, of vaccines nationalism. We subscribe to a regime that globally ensures, that, uh, ensures fairness in access, equity in financing, and is founded on the principle of social solidarity and equity. It's only in this way that we, the most vulnerable locally and globally will be protected. Without this, the poorest people in the world, poorest countries are most affected by lack of access to vaccines. Inevitably, the consequent slower rollout vaccine of vaccines in lower income countries will negatively impact on economic prosperity and development in those countries. Uh, however, the greatest lesson that uh, uh, vaccine nationalism has taught us is the critical agency for Africa to develop its own capacity to manufacture and distribute in its own biotechnology. That we have to take as an agent assignment that will make sure that come other pandemics in the future, Africa is capable of manufacturing its own requirements, whether it is protective gear, uh, pharmaceutical products, uh, diagnostics, uh, vaccines, and equipment. Africa should not be reliant on various other uh, countries where it has no own capacity, because that will make it difficult to respond, as we have seen in the fight against COVID. We were constrained when there was a global shortage that our continent could not uh, address this issue. It's also been quite uh, a, a, a challenge to rely on various other countries uh, when the entire continent has no access to the manufacturing capacity for vaccines. I think this is a lesson that we must never be able, that we must learn now and be never put in this situation where our response is very much dependent on other countries serving their own uh, domestic interests first and therefore see the continent is seen as the last to benefit in the queue. And I think therefore that uh, a lot of work has to be done <laughs> to make sure that uh, the African continent is also generally self-sufficient. Uh, Aspen is the only center in the whole continent so far that is able to produce any form of vaccine, even if it's a limited participation in the value chain. 
And this needs to be changed for, for the future so that uh, we can manufacture in the continent as much of our requirements. A final lesson I'd like to share relates to the evident need for alternative reimbursement models that are practical, easy to implement and transparent. Transparent in our efforts to draw <clears throat> on the expertise and capacity of the private sector, that is hospitals, laboratories, healthcare uh, professionals, uh, it is qu quickly became apparent that there's a huge gap in this expertise. Having said this, uh, uh, having said that, this created an indication for continued engagement between public and private sectors. A clear departure from the past where this type of discourse could not happen without lending in court. This lays a strong foundation for the National Health Insurance Fund provider accreditation and contracting environment. Distinguished guests, you will agree with me that these lessons are not in any way exhausting. As the pandemic evolves, our lessons treasure trove, expands, and through our participation in global economy, we continue to learn new things from these con other contexts. What is important for us is to ensure that we use what we learn to uh, what we learn to inform our broader policy reforms around the phase implementation of our universal health coverage. Lastly, I'd like to, I would like to reflect on the context of the health system's resilience, a key ideology that has been highlighted throughout the course of this global pandemic. To quote from the Lancet, Lancet Viewpoint article by Margaret E. Crook uh, uh, and colleagues in 2015, and I want to quote, health systems resilience can be defined as the capacity of the health actors, institutions, and populations to prepare for and, for and effectively respond to crises, maintain core function, uh, functions when a crisis hits, and informed by lessons learned during the crisis, reorganize uh, if conditions require it. Health systems are resilient if they protect human life and produce good health outcomes uh, for all during a crisis and its aftermath. Resilient health systems can also deliver everyday benefits and positive outcomes. This down benefits improves performance in both, uh, improve performance in both bad and good times is what has been called the, resi the resilience dividend, unquote. So as a collective, uh, this is what we must continuously strive towards. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has been devastating, but uh, as a diamond forms from coal under pressure, so too must we emerge stronger and more refined from this cataclysmic experience. This is a time for action, complacency and individualism must be left behind. Our clarion core must be to ensure that no one is left behind as we lift our most vulnerable from poverty and disenfranchisement. So too do we elevate our economies and our cultures and our identity as an African nation. Africa will rise above this. We are in this together and we are stronger, stronger together. Thank you very much. I really appreciate the opportunity to share these ideas with you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Minister. Um, I'm not going to reflect too much on what the Minister has just said because we're about to go into the um, panel discussion, which is entitled Universal Health Coverage and Health Security for Addressing Health Inequities. And if we look at the topics, we will see that um, this will definitely be a segue a conversation from the remarks that the Minister has made. But with um, the esteemed panelists' indulgence, I will say that um, Minister, uh, in, in, in not very long, the uh, parliamentary hearings for, for um, the NHI are going to resume. We know that they were disrupted by the COVID-19 pandemic. And for sure, we will have many of the participants um, participating in those panel discussions. And I hope that the lessons that the Minister has outlined in the conversation we are about to have um, are going to be food for thought as we prepare to head into um, that very, very important um, phase of our uh, contemplation of the NHI bill. And so without much, much further ado, if I may be allowed to introduce the speakers, um, we, we are going to have in this panel discussion, Professor John Atakuba, uh, Professor Lydia Kancross, Professor Flavia Singh-Bulge and Professor Rob van Niekerk. And um, uh, we'll start with Professor John Atakuba, who will be discussing the impact of COVID-19 on health um, inequities. And I'll just very briefly introduce uh, Professor Atakuba, who is he, uh, an economist and an associate professor 
and Director of Health Economics Unit at the University of Cape Town. And he's also uh, served as the Interim South African Research Chair in Health and Wealth. That was from 2018 to 2020 and has significant experience in several sub-Saharan uh, uh, African countries, including Nigeria and South Africa. He is the Deputy Director for the African Health Economics and Policy Association, and is in charge of uh, capacity development and a member um, of the Board of Directors for the International Health Economics Association. Also a prolific uh, career in research, academia, science, um, and health economics, and we really look forward to what you have to say to us. And I, I see, Professor, you are ready with the presentation. So thank you very much, Professor. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. We come out of that World Health Day webinar, Health Minister Dr. Zulim Kize yet again reiterating the call against vaccine nationalism, also speaking about the lessons of the past year and unprecedented actions and interventions in efforts to fight COVID-19 that have resulted in insecurity in many areas of our lives and that we should strive for a fairer and healthier South Africa in our efforts to fight the pandemic and leave no one behind. He also spoke about alternative investment models for provision of health, saying public-private relationships proved very crucial. Also, Dr. Matsiri Somedi, the Africa Regional Director of the World Health Organization, led the conversation for this World Health Day webinar, speaking about inequity in health due to socioeconomic circumstances, also using multiple data points to convey the message of inequitable access to health. Uh, the Deputy Minister of Health, Dr. Joe Patla, also spoke. Uh, our question of the day is related to this conversation. We're asking you how best can we build a fairer and healthier world for everyone. Of course, you can send your inputs at the agenda underscore SABC. We'll take a look at them at some point in the show. But to this now, ANC President Sir Ramaphosa accompanied